The Crown Season 5 is here in all its glory. Once again, the show dances around what's fiction and what's not without really attempting to let the audience know the honest answer. Classic The Crown behavior. Now, whether you're an enthusiastic viewer or you've gotten fatigued at this point, you'll probably agree that Episode 3 was surprisingly good, mostly because of Sidney Johnson. But who really was he? Today, let's take a look at his life. First up, who was the real Sidney Johnson? No, your eyes didn't fool you. He was a black man, and he was the Duke of Windsor's personal valet. But before we get into his years of service to the abdicated king, let's tell you more about how it all started. Sadly, not much is known about his life, partly because he was a very private man, and partly because nobody bothered much to find out more about him. The man doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. Do you know who has a Wikipedia page? The Royal Corgis. Johnson was born on Andros, the biggest island in the Bahamas, somewhere between 1921 and 1923. Sixteen years later, his life would change forever. When he was a teenage beach attendant, the Duke of Windsor abdicated the throne and was exiled to the Bahamas and made the governor. This was during World War II, and the then Prime Minister made the decision to exile him and make him governor because he wanted him out of Europe. Why? Well, this Duke guy had a soft for the Nazis. Well, while on his forced vacation on the islands, he found Sydney, and it's fair to say this young man won his favor immediately and became his footman. The rest is, well, history. By the end of the war, Sydney was already a valet and such an integral part of the royal household that the Duke decided his place as a valet was going to be permanent. And so, the Windsors took him with them wherever they went, eventually settling down in Bois de Boulogne. Sidney Johnson went on to serve the Duke for 30 years. Up next, his relationship with the Duke of Windsor. Johnson is said to have shared a very close bond with the Duke. He loved and respected his royal employer. Hugo Vickers, the royal employer, said he met Sidney in 1989 in Paris. He remembered him as a delightful man with great human sympathy and a warm smile. But most importantly, according to Vickers, Johnson seemed to love and respect the Windsors a lot and spoke well of them. And there's no doubt this is true. There's a recording of the Duke's valet of 30 years speaking very fondly of how the royal had an unmatched personality and charisma. He went as far as to say that the Duke was the best-looking man he'd ever seen. To be fair to him, considering the exceptionally low bar that the men of the royal family have set, the abdicated king might have been the easiest in the eyes of the Bahamian valet and those surroundings. We don't doubt you, Sidney. Your choices were offensively limited. As for the Duke of Windsor himself, he also seemed to have held Johnson in very high regard. Like, the fact that he decided to employ him was enough evidence of that. Back then, the royal protocols were very clear about prohibiting the employment of people of color. So yeah, next to the treason he could have potentially committed by siding with the Nazis or something, hiring a black man as a personal valet was probably the most controversial thing he did as a royal in those days. The Duke left him $30,000 in his will, which amounts to $200,000 today. Following up, how did his service end? During the Duke and Duchess's time in Paris, Sidney fell in love with a French woman and married her. Together, they had four children. Wait a minute, this will all connect to how he got fired. Yes, fired. Now, while the Duke was very fond of Johnson, it seems like Duchess Wallace Simpson wasn't a big fan. Or, maybe her views changed after the Duke's death in 1972. But come on, that can't be it. You either like someone, or you don't. And we'll make a case for why the latter was true for Wallace. 1972 was a tough year for the Bahamian. First, the Duke died, and later the same year, his beloved wife passed away, leaving him on his own to take care of his four children. His relationship with Wallace during this time had already started to get a bit rough, but then finally, he reached his last straw. It's said that he asked Wallace for flexible working hours, specifically allowing him to go home early because he had his kids to look after. Apparently, the Duchess didn't like this and told him something along the lines of, if you go early, don't come back. Our man Sidney did just that. He left and never came back. What a goat. So yeah, we think it's true that Wallace never really let go of her racist ideals. She wasn't very close with Johnson while her husband was alive. It's just that after his death, she didn't feel like she needed to be low-key about it anymore. Moving on, his time with Mohammed Al-Fayed. After Wallace fired him, Johnson found work in the Ritz in Paris. This is where the Egyptian Anglophile billionaire first saw him. As the story goes, after buying the Ritz, the first thing Al-Fayed did was fire him because he didn't think having black employees was good for the reputation of the hotel. But later, he found that this black man was none other than the Duke of Windsor's valet. This was when his ambitious inner businessman told his inner racist to curb his racism. Al-Fayed ended up employing Johnson himself, mostly so that he could teach him the ways of the British aristocracy. So yeah, Sidney's job basically became to teach the Egyptian billionaire how to be a grumpy white gentleman properly. During this time, the two actually ended up developing a bond of respect for each other. After Johnson's death, Al-Fayed called him a gentleman of gentlemen and said that he would be missed deeply. Coming up, the renovation of Villa Windsor. Remember the Windsor's residence in Paris, Bois de Boulogne? Well, it was later named Villa Windsor for obvious reasons. By the 1980s, the villa was in pretty 
incomplete condition, and Johnson had a deep desire to renovate it to make it look like it did in its glory days. There was one obstacle, though. Wallace Simpson was still living there. It was after her death in 1986 that Sidney convinced his new employer, Al Fayed, to help with his dream of renovating the place. Al Fayed was obviously game. He was game for anything that had the potential to impress the royals, even remotely. And so he got the lease on the villa and put Johnson in charge of the $9 million renovation plan. It took three years of work to return the place to its former glory, and Johnson was beyond happy and proud at the opening party. It's said that he was in tears and said he was feeling on top of the world. Apparently, he said he felt like the Duchess would climb down the stairs at any moment and ask him, how do I look? Al Fayed was impressed with Johnson's work and said this man was a dictionary because of all the knowledge he had about the artifacts. Sadly, only three months later, Sidney Johnson passed away. Now, let's talk about Charles and Camilla's infamous phone call. First off, make way for Tampon Gate. They promised us this season would be the most controversial, and they did not disappoint. Or they did disappoint, depending on who's watching. In the episode The Way Ahead, we see the reenactment of the phone call that still haunts the now king's nightmares. Back in 1989, a private phone call between Charles and Camilla got somehow leaked and later published in the papers. The scandal was nicknamed Tampon Gate. Now, there's no right way to say this, but this romantic conversation somehow went from the two needling each other to Charles being reincarnated as a sanitary product. The show used the exact transcript of the call, but included some fiction, such as Camilla's husband overhearing the conversation. Here's why the royalists are concerned. If you think the universe messes with you, just think about Charles. This man was crowned king, and only a month or so later, the world is watching a masterfully reenacted version of his embarrassing steamy talk on Netflix. So yeah, the royalists might be right about the fact that the crown bringing up the dark past of the king will hurt his reputation among his subjects. Even Netflix agreed to add a disclaimer this season after Dame Judi Dench requested it. She also thought that it would be damaging if people believed everything on the show to be an accurate depiction. Lastly, here's what Dominic West thinks. Dominic West, who plays Charles this season, has sympathy for him. He thinks it was wrong for the private conversation to be made public because it took away all context. The way he sees it, it's just two people trying to be sweet to each other. Wes asked people to imagine how damaging it would be if all our vulnerable moments were out for the world to see. That's a wrap for this video. What was your favorite episode of The Crown Season 5? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one. I want to reach those that have been overlooked, rejected. There I go again. Always a little wine with my cheese. <laughs> On the tongue, as you come. Everything happens at the end of the day. In every situation. Really? Should I cover my ears? How long has the pressure been down on that ground? Since this morning, sir. Sydney? Sydney? We should reassure the public about the strength of our marriage.